So you should imagine this is less a kind of classic tech talk and more of a provocation or a mediation on a topic that has been kind of poking at my consciousness for a couple of years. And I'm really excited to have this opportunity to have an audience that I can engage with a little bit about it. You can't help but notice if you spend any time in Silicon Valley or frankly anywhere where people are talking about technology that there's been a lot of conversations about the Internet of Things, usually followed by 50 billion by 2020. And that's kind of the two pieces of the story you need to know, right? And I'm always really struck by the fact that's a very hard topic to approach as a researcher and as a thinker. And for me, I wanted to find a new way into that notion of the Internet of Things. So what was a kind of a different perspective or a new angle? And there's lots of ways that you could go about doing that. But it's actually really important to kind of note here that I am an anthropologist in a tech company. And I'm not just an anthropologist by training. I'm an anthropologist by well, background and lived experience. I grew up on my mum's field sites in central and northern Australia in the 1970s and 1980s. So I spent my childhood living with Indigenous people in a time right as the Land Rights Act was happening, but in a time when people still remembered their country before white fellas and fences and cattle. And I spent most of my childhood not going to school, not speaking English. I spoke Walpri and a pigeon in that community and killing things. Um, I, I hasten to add I ate them just before anyone really gets a bit too concerned about that. And it was a really feral childhood. I mean, it might be as good as it gets, basically. It was licensed, you know, anarchy. And it's a really long way from that to Silicon Valley. And I think, you know, in many ways for me, that kind of notion of anthropology as a way to see familiar things from a different angle is a hugely important skill I've brought to Intel. And, you know, mostly my job here over the last 18 years has been about how do you give a different sort of view and a perspective into technology. Mine's always been in the human perspective. How do you think about what people care about, what frustrates them, what they're passionate about, what they worry about, and how do you use all of those to shape the next generation of technology? Usually someone asks how I ended up at Intel because truthfully I was a professor at Stanford when I was recruited here. And the answer is it's a good Australian story. I met a man in a bar and I ended up at Intel. Um, there's obviously more that goes to that story, but that's the piece you just need to know. That's the important part. Man, bar, Palo Alto, Intel. And you know, therein is my non-career advice to those of you who are anthropologists thinking of other disciplinary activities. Hang around in bars, say yes to men, goodness will follow. But truthfully, please don't take that advice because I will get in trouble. The reality is more complicated than that, but it is about this notion of how do you bring a different point of view. But for me over the last two years, I've also taken on a slightly different role in the company, which is as the company's futurist. So my job has been to think not just about the present, but also about the future. And it turns out when one calls oneself a futurist, it's very hard not to think about all the other kinds of people who have had that role historically, right? Futurism has a very particular history in the West and in the 21st century, you know, associated with 20th century modernism and a bunch of other things. But truthfully, the notion of people telling stories about the future are as old as human societies. There have always been people who did this whether it's the Oracle of Delphi pictured here or soothsayers and fortune tellers and witches and economists. There are lots of people who have thought about how do you tell a story? Yes, I did just put economists in that list. How do you tell a story about the future and why would you do that, right? And I think if you look at the places that have strong traditions of future-leaning narratives, they're about how do you make sense of the world how do you think about appropriating your resources appropriately? How do you think about controlling or protecting from what might be coming? How do you arrange the assets you have in a way to maximize returns? And it really is this kind of notion of how might you see into the world from yet another perspective and have that landscape into the world tell you something. And truthfully, one of the most persistent and popular ways of doing this, which I was fascinated when I started to go and explore this, one of the most persistent and popular ways of trying to make sense of the future is to look to the present. And in this regard, it's remarkably like anthropology, except the looking to the present in this regard is to look to the behavior of animals as a proxy for where the future might go. 
And, you know, there's multiple different traditions of various forms of augury. So watching the flights of birds, looking at the entrails of animals, looking at the patterns of spiders, snakes, all manner of other animals as this way of thinking about the future. And animals become really this important and interesting part of many traditions of how do you think about what the future might bring. And many of those are clearly tied up with religions, tied up with the metaphysical. But truthfully, in the 20th and 21st centuries, research scientists have also looked to animals as lead indicators for the future, whether as warnings about environmental change and transformation. So think about the conversations we now have about frogs, for instance, about bees, about polar bears, they've all become leading signs of climate change, right? And so the animals become a proxy for what is going on in the world that we may need to attend to. There are also researchers like Anne Galloway and Donna Haraway who think about animals and their relationships to humanity as a way of reimagining what it means to be human, but also what it means to be on the planet and in dialogue with other resources. So it turns out that the relationship between animals, the present, people, and the future has been a really kind of complicated morass that you can sort of unpick for a really long time. And for me, as I was thinking about all of that, I realized there's a way that the contemporary kind of internet of things and animals and their story about the future all intersect. And it's partly about this moment when animals move from being analog to digital. I know that's a funny way of thinking about it, but if you think about sort of the way the world has been of late, many things have moved from analog to digital, whether it was books, music, film, information, relationships, we've kind of had this digital overlay, but it turns out animals have followed a similar arc and truthfully a little bit earlier than humans did. Starting in the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, mostly endangered species started to find themselves tagged by human beings with new technologies. In the early days, simply ra radio tags, basically, so that you could track uh, mostly uh, bears for a long time and other forms of endangered wildlife so that you could start to have some sense of their movements. And much of the environmental and eco movement was based on top of that early mapping. But since then, we've moved on from radio tags and collars to things that are much more sophisticated, whether it's real-time GPS technology with a satellite back end, whether it's cameras, whether it's electronic sensors, both on animals and in the environment. There's been this move to start thinking about animals as part of a larger digital ecosystem. The images here are from a colleague of mine in Britain who has an RFID tagged collar attached to her cat Daphne. You can follow Daphne on Twitter, should you like, under the handle Daphne Flap, because it turns out in addition to having a smart tagged collar, Daphne's collar is actually set to trigger the camera inside her cat flap so that you can see the cat coming and going. Now, for Daphne's owner, Kate, that means that she is sometimes at the office and discovers that Daphne has brought home a mouse, which is now only half dead inside her house. Um, so in this case, you know, it's gone from a kind of cat now can communicate via this proxy of the cat's action triggers an activity. The cat's flap also does trigger Twitter, which is an interesting kind of cat as tweeting object. And I'm sure somewhere in there are bad puns there about birds, tweets and cats and pussy cats that I don't really want to get into, but you can just follow along. Now, you can imagine that's like one consumer who is a tech journalist doing lead adopter activity, but she's hardly alone in what could be described as an entire world of Actually, these things are called critter cams. Um, the National Geographic maintains the most extraordinary web page aggregator of cameras attached to animals. So if you suddenly don't know what to do with your day and you need to lose like the better part of an afternoon looking at cameras attached to animals, you should go to the National Geographic's animals backslash critter cam page and you will find all of them. Like everything you ever wanted to find a camera attached to can be found there. I figured because I was getting to talk to home, I should probably have one that was local. Uh, those of you who didn't grow up in the Northern Territory will not immediately recognize this as a sand gold monitor or a goanna, but I did. Um, this turns out to be a monitor lizard from the great Victorian desert in Western Australia. So think the WA, South Australian NT border. Think a desert that's mostly full of dirt, spinifex and lizards. Um, and an enterprising American 
a man deeply obsessed with lizards uh, by the name of Eric Pianka, who also maintains an extraordinary website, uh, has been attaching cameras to these lizards. Now, these goannas range anywhere from about a metre to two and a half metres long, so they're not insubstantial. You can see from the granularity of this photo that this rather unsuspecting lizard has had this camera velcroed to its head. Um, I imagine Araldite is involved to keep it there. Um, and you can, should you want to know what this camera produces, track this one on National Geographic in a forthcoming special in October. I sound like I'm hawking for National Geographic here, but they do really like their critter cams. Now, of course, there are some interesting things about this phenomena, right? One of the seductions is that it promises we can see the world from a different viewpoint, that we can have a moment of putting ourselves in not someone else's shoes, but something else's shoes. And that in so doing, maybe some other truth, a ground truth, if you'll pardon the pun here, would be revealed, right? That there's something about that point of view and that perspective that might open up something different. Of course, it's also hard to... Um, escape the notion here that there is also some kind of fairly complicated voyeurism ongoing with these creatures that you are now kind of piggybacking yourself onto. And of course, it doesn't just extend to wildlife shows and attaching cameras to any number of animals. There started to be scientific projects based on the same thing. Uh, in 2013, in the United Kingdom, the Royal College of Veterinary Scientists decided to track cats you know, there's a lot of cats around. It seemed like a reasonably safe project. They took 50 cats in Surrey Hill in, um, well, Surrey, and they put tracking things on them, a GPS tracking device and a micro camera. They took 624-hour periods over a couple of weeks, and they tracked multiple cats. Um, and what they started to find in some ways became really interesting. Now, in the UK, it was billed under the headline, The Secret Lives of Cats. Uh, where this appeared in uh, in Britain. And in some ways, for those of you who've ever owned a cat, uh, some of these things would surprise you, some of them would not. Uh, it turns out cats have much greater ranges, if these are indoor or outdoor cats, they have much greater ranges than we had historically expected, upwards of, you know, five to 10 kilometers in an evening. Uh, so, you know, if you imagined your cat is running off somewhere else, you're not wrong. Uh, what is less likely that you imagined, but in some ways you may be complicit in, is that it turns out about, 40% of the cats that were tracked in this study were being fed somewhere else. So they lived with you, but they went and got food from another household. That means there are some households that are feeding cats that are actually, that's their second dinner, not their first. And it turned out many of those cats were regular visitors in a second home. So, you know, cats had multiple owners. Owners didn't realize they had cats that had multiple owners. It also turned out that these cats killed everything, literally everything and only brought a very small amount of it home. Um, and so because the cameras were on the cats, you started to see the basically cat carnage, which led to some other interesting conversations in the UK about the loss of British wildlife to cats. Okay, so fine, that study. Same time period, same technology, same study performed in the United States, pretty much the same findings. The only significant difference being that when the research was published, it was published under the headline, killer cats on the rampage versus secret lights of cats. So same data, different interpretation. I think what becomes most interesting here is the notion that the technology reveals unexpected secrets and that those secrets start to challenge our conventional wisdom, right? But here it really is just about the cats. Of course, you start to think about, well, what else do you have on scale that might tell you something here that you might want to start I don't know, get tapping more into some of the productivity discourses that map on top of IoT. Uh, more obvious sort of experiments then become things like the ones that are being done with cows. Uh, so in the same time period as the cats were being tracked in the United Kingdom, there were a series of studies that were being done in early um, prototype experiments in the United States, mostly in upstate New York, where transponders were put on cows' collars and those transponders were linked to automatic milking machines. So when the cows came to effectively the milking station, the transponder in their neck triggered the machine to open up its gates as they walked in. Miniature lasers aligned the suction cups to their teats and the cows basically, as they moved forward, it triggered the machine to attach itself to the cow's udders and start milking the cow. I know that sounds mildly terrifying, um, 
and there was some issues about whether cows would accept this or not, right? Um, and some issues about getting all the positionality right. What was fascinating was that constellation of laser scanning, gate tracking, and timing and automatic triggers had an almost instantaneous effect on milk production on these farms. Because it turned out that historically, as long as humans have co-lived with cows, we milk them twice a day, dawn and dusk, because that's a convenient time. It turns out if you're a cow, you like to be milked as often as you damn well can. And in most cows, that was somewhere between four to six times a day. And so once these machines were there, suddenly what cows wanted became visible to farmers in a way that it simply hadn't been before. The technology may have been about making milk happen, but the side effect of it was that you suddenly had an insight into what cows want, at least at a very minimal notion, right? Cows' desires here became much clearer. Now, frankly, if you've ever been a nursing mother, you can understand why you probably don't want to wait for two times a day when you could have something happen more often. And so for the cows, this was pretty practical. For the farmers, it turned out that the amount of surplus milk that was generated here paid off the cost of production pretty quickly. Now, what is fascinating to me is as these projects unfold, there's the technical configuration and then one that's a little bit more speculative. And as these machines were being installed, a collection of students in a research lab up in Canada, so just across the border, started to imagine what the cows might have been thinking as this was happening. And they also went to Twitter. So from a group in the critical media lab at the University of Waterloo, they created a dairy diary. Uh, this is just pun central, called it the teat tweet, and imagined each one of these cows that, yeah, in Queensland, the man in the second row in the, the checked shirt, you are my hero. I love that you think this is as funny as I do. And so they created an entire wonderful diary imagining what these cows might be thinking as they attempted to encounter the technology. Um, I'm torn between thinking, tried to get in but was rebuffed, snap, versus the slowest teat is my back left. Um, both of which are kind of delightful. But here what you see is trying to imagine how do you give animals a voice here? And yes, it's art, but it's also about this kind of notion of as the machines make things visible, what is it that they are making visible and how might you start to unpack the relationship here between the technical possibilities and the notion of what it would be to empower these animals to be engaging fully with these systems. Closer to home, in multiple ways, uh, there's been an ongoing uh, set of experiments between Data61 and the CSIRO, a couple of scientific organizations around the world and Intel to start to try and use technology to understand hive collapse and bee-based activity. So over the last 18 months, 50,000 bees in Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, the UAE, Kenya and Mexico have all been tagged with little tiny RFID tags. I did ask the principal and scientist who was working on this how you tag to be. His answer was very carefully, um, which seemed like a smart answer. The second part of the answer was Tarzan's grip, uh, which for those of you who didn't grow up in Australia is a particularly nasty form of glue. So these bees are all being hand tagged. So 50,000 bees in about seven different countries. Um, and what became very clear very quickly, again, was this sort of interesting set of relationships. So RFID tag sensors on the bees, sensors on the hives, and the notion became to start, how do you track activity, but also environmental activity to see what would be revealed? The technology here works a little bit like a black box on an airplane or a vehicle tracking system. So it was tracking flight patterns as well as locations of stops. Um, of course, that analogy only goes so far because bees aren't airplanes and they turn out to be part of large organic systems. But these tracking systems, revealed again this disconnect between what we thought bees were up to and what bees were as far as these tracking systems revealed actually up to. So in these studies in multiple hives in multiple countries uh, it turned out one of the first things that became clear was that bees much like their cat counterparts call more than one hive home. So about 25% of the bees spent time in a hive that was not the hive that had their queen. Now, up until now, what we had understood to be true about bees was that they had one queen, one hive, and that was it. If you start to imagine that 25% of the bees are spending their time hanging around somewhere else, it's a little easier to start to imagine why hive collapse happens at the rate it does. 
it turns out that you actually have bees transmitting whatever is going on here themselves between hives in their sort of nat native and nat natural activities, natural in quotes there. You also have some other things that start to be revealed too about how well bees are navigating built environments and known environments and about the relationships between environmental pollutants and the hives. But in some ways, again, this notion that the data stream starts to m make a challenge to the conventional wisdom about what is happening is in one ways one of the important kind of stories that comes out of this. Also just the sheer scale of the tagging, right? Citizen science brings you a completely different point of view here. So starting about four years ago in the US, there was a Kickstarter project uh, aptly named Project Snow Owl that put tags on owls. So snow owls sort of about this size, so not insubstantial. There was a really warm winter here in the Northern Hemisphere three winters ago, and it created more snow owls than they'd ever been before. And they came further south in the United States than had ever been seen before. And people got really interested in kind of trying to make sense of what was happening with them. And so an enterprising collection of amateur bird watchers uh, in Massachusetts, I believe, decided that what they wanted to do was try and tag the owls and see where they were going. They built a series of solar powered transmitters in lightweight Teflon harnesses um, and attached them to the owls. Uh, it's a quite awkward process to put them on the owls, but they were very determined that it shouldn't impact the owl's flight and it didn't. You can now log on to their website and track all of the owls individually and see where they're going. And there's an incredibly high level of kind of granularity of flight paths here. Um, though delightfully, one of the things that became clear in this is that the cellular transmission technology is completely different between Canada and the United States. And so the owls appeared to disappear when they went to Canada until you actually had to realize that the way that the Canadian system does its cell tower pulses, it was pulsing at a completely different rate. So it wasn't that the owls were disappearing per se, it's just that they'd moved so quickly between cell towers, they appeared to have magically evaporated at the US-Canadian border. And it took a while to retune the technology to find these owls again. Uh, what became clear in this particular project and is ongoingly clear is that owls really like the built environment. So this is one of these studies where it suggests that whilst the built environment has significant negative consequences on lots of animals, the owls use a lot of the infrastructure to increase their hunting range, whether they use buoys or buoys as Americans would say in the ocean as a place to perch while they wait for things, whether they use telephone towers and wires as a way of places where their prey will accidentally get caught up so they don't have to do the work. But again, it becomes this kind of story about as you track these animals, you discover a much greater range than was previously anticipated, a much greater use of existing technologies, and some really interesting transformations in the tracking technologies itself. And of course, here what was interesting was that each one of these owls is basically sponsored by a human being. So the tracking here is only made possible through voluntary funding. It's not state-based, it's individual. So it's effectively crowdsourced IoT. So a kind of, you know, civic science crowdsourced IoT project, which for me was sort of fascinating. Similarly, in other encounters with birds in this case, um, there's a kind of a long and complicated story about albatross who, like the snow owls, are an endangered species, but who, unlike the snow owls, have had a much harder encounter with human infrastructure. Albatross have been endangered in the world for probably about 35 years, a little bit longer, in no small part because of a particular fishing technique that has been pioneered by the Japanese using what is called these long line fishing lines. When I say long line, I'm talking anywhere between uh, 70 to 80 kilometres of fishing line with hooks at individual things that are pushed out the back of fishing trawlers. The lines catch the fish, but if you're a deep sea diving bird like the albatross are, you go under, get caught on the hook, and never come up again. Somewhere around 300,000 to 400,000 albatross die a year because of this. Um, as a result, most of the remaining albatross on the planet are tagged. The albatross are so used to being tagged and having the data collected from them that I have a colleague of mine who works uh, on an albatross tagging project and spends a lot of his time on the boats off the coast of uh, rural New South Wales, Wollongong in particular, hardly rural, but down that way. And he says that when the albatross land on boats, they put out their left leg and wait for something to happen to it. They wait for the tag to get put on, the tag to get taken off. They wait and then they just start squawking because they understand the deal. You tag me, you feed me. So get on with tagging me so you'll feed me. 
So here is a system that is kind of designed where the birds are very clear what the system of exchange is and they are just waiting for the scientists to pony up and get on with it. And, you know, there's something sort of delightfully complicated about who's being socialised into what under those circumstances, but also about the notion that these tagging experiences are not neutral, right? They're clearly part of longest relationships and are shaping the bird's behaviour as much as the bird's behaviour is being monitored. Starting in about 2000 in the UK to worry about the albatross. And so they decided to take advantage of the tagging that was available here to actually monitor the albatross. And in true um, fashion that as Australians we could understand but came out of the UK, they decided they would create a race for the albatross and let people bet on them. So think of this as TAB albatross betting, but it was a Ladbrook in the UK. So Ladbrook betting on albatross as a way to raise money to save the albatross. You know, so far, okay, fine. Um, they had individual people uh, sponsor the albatross. My favourite one of which was that actually Samuel Coolridge's great-grandson actually sponsored an albatross, and there's something so delightfully ironic in that I don't know where to go with it. But so there was this first race, 20 albatross, I think, start out in Tasmania. And they're supposed to get to the tip of South Africa. Uh, 20 start, three arrive. Uh, great if you're Ladbrook. I'm sure they made a lot of money on this. Not so good if you're the albatross. So they tried again the next year and no albatross arrive in South Africa, at which point the great albatross race was cancelled due to lack of, well, successful albatross racing. But it suggested that the thing that was known about this area, i.e. albatross die, was what was revealed by the technology. And truthfully, once they started to tag the albatross here, they discovered that the albatross flew in completely straight lines across the southern oceans. And, of course, they're completely straight lines because as much as they are killed by the deep-line fishing, they are also tracing the deep-line fishing because it produces food for them. So, again, the data here doing this complicated thing, right? You tag the birds and what it reveals is that the birds are vulnerable. We knew the birds were vulnerable before the birds were tagged. So the data becomes a kind of self-fulfilling truth in some ways. More speculatively, people are starting to think about, well, okay, what other animals could we tag? And again, because it's Australia, I thought I should at least mention sheep. Um, lots of speculative projects about sheep. Uh, there's a couple going on in rural Wales, uh, so neither Australia nor New Zealand, but Wales, where the idea was, could you turn sheep into an ad hoc wireless cloud? Uh, so Wales suffers from poor... It's true. Wales suffers from poor telecommunications infrastructure and there are a lot of sheep. Um, so the idea was if you could use somehow the sheep to basically produce a wireless network, would that be a good idea? I have so many questions about this. I don't quite know where to start, but I offer it for the notion of kind of wireless ad hoc networking brought to you by sheep. In Australia, the more in some ways sensible and pragmatic conversation has been about if you can get sensing technology cheap enough that you could tag an entire flock. So we're talking kind of, you know, tens of thousands of sheep. Could you start to map the flock as an organic organism, basically? And if you could data visualize it effectively, could you start to see threats on the edge of the flock? So a dingo or some other predator, mostly dingoes. And if you could, could you start to identify the patterns that flocks go through as they avoid predators and start to use it as a predator detection system and an early warning system to protect the flock? That's predicated on being able to get the sensing technology down into a price range that we just really haven't seen yet. In New Zealand, one of my colleagues, Anne Galloway, who is a remarkable uh, design, interaction designer and sort of social science researcher, has been starting to do design research with the sheep and doing this design fiction exercise of where does she start to say, well, if we started to think about sheep and the Internet of Things and really speculate about sheep as part and parcel of a larger environment, what are the stories you would tell and the technologies you would build around them if you imagined both ubiquitous technology and ubiquitous sheep? And, you know, I'd encourage you to go to her website to look at her stuff because it really is quite delightful. And then last but by no means least, for as much as the technology is about tracking and making things visible, one of the other interesting consequences about tracking technology is in fact the precise opposite feeling. So tracking makes things visible, but not all things should be visible, it turns out. So this notice started to appear on social media about 18 months ago. Uh, on a wildlife preserve in southern Africa, asking people who were taking pictures of endangered rhinos to strip them of their metadata when they posted them. 
because the metadata was actually making the animals themselves vulnerable because it revealed their location. So here are animals who are in some ways tagged but would like to be remain invisible. I think a thing some of us might understand. Um, turns out similar concern has emerged in India with Bengal tigers who are also endangered and who in at least one wildlife preserve are tagged with RFID tags so that the keepers of the preserve can track the Bengal tigers, but someone hacked the RFID tags, located the tigers and killed them. So the same technology that makes tracking visible becomes uh, in some ways dangerous and raises you know, the usual kind of questions that I think you might get to. So why am I telling you all of that? I'm clearly not a zoologist. I'm not particularly, you know, gonna sort of wanna spend the rest of my life talking about the connection of animals to the internet. So why is all of this relevant and what do all those stories tell us and why should you pay attention to them? Well, I think what's really interesting about looking at animals is in some ways they are some of the first stories about systems being connected to the internet and they have moral like stories have morals, they have moral stories to tell us here. Part of them are about the fact that many of those instances of tagging animals tell us things we already knew but don't want to acknowledge. The albatross is an obvious example. We know that albatross are dying. The technology tells us they are dying and yet behaviors don't necessarily change. So there's something interesting in that thread, right? When you think about some of the, the work that we imagine big data will do. We say, if we just have more data, we will know what's really going on and change will happen. The reality is when you look at some of these systems that already exist to produce data, change has not necessarily followed. The second thing is, is that it suggests that not all tracking and not all data is created equal. So there are some things where you might wanna say there are secrets hiding in plain sight. So think about the cats, right? Uh, Cats don't really have secret lives. They just have lives we don't know about. Does that make them a secret? It's an interesting kind of notion, right? And what does it mean to reveal things that would otherwise be unknown or unknowable? For cats, it may not be so bad that, you know, the secret lives of the cats of Surrey Hills was displayed all over the BBC. You may feel differently if it is the secret lives of and inner Brisbane suburbs water collection activities that are now on the front pages of, you know, the Queensland papers. How does one suddenly feel when a set of things that were tacit truths become public trackable truths and how does one feel about that? We recently completed an ethnographic study here at Intel with people using um, water sensing technology just to talk about their water consumption in Arizona. So a little bit like an Australian kind of relationship to water. And in many ways, people knew how much water they were consuming. But when you started to reveal to them the patterns of it, we found unexpected disputes in households emerged around it. So, you know, a husband and wife where he likes his clothes clean every day. And the consequence of that is what his wife did washing every day. He somehow hadn't noticed she did washing every day and was staggered by the water monitoring technology that suggested the washing machine was running every day. She asked him where he thought the clothes came from. And it became quite clear that there were multiple patterns existing inside that household that were not shared and that the sharing of them was not necessarily a neutral activity without consequence. So there is something here where we start to say, what does it mean when we say connecting things, we will know things. What does that knowing mean? What are the consequences and how does one manage that, right? What will it mean to imagine that things are revealed? Now, the flip side of that is that there are clearly a number of these stories about animals, I would say the bees and the cows at least, where the revelation of what the animals are doing or what the animals' desires might be challenge some of our conventional worldviews. They start to suggest that as human beings, arguably in some places as scientists, we have had a normative view of the world that we have imposed onto that landscape. Bees <laughs> hang out in their own hives. Cows get milked twice a day. One is the logic of science. One is probably the logic of late capitalism. But as soon as you start to have data emergent from those two classes of animals, it challenges the models that are at work there. And you can well imagine that as data collection starts to come to other systems, whether it is cities, homes, or factories, we might also start to see ways we imagine the world to be get challenged by the data itself. And then we have to start to think of what are the models we are imposing and what is the reality of those models? So things that appear to be a reasonable way of making sense of things may be more hypothesis than fact. 
And so how do we also then have a critical lens about what are the algorithms and analytics we apply to big data to extract meaning out of them? And how do we ensure that those aren't bringing with them ideas that are simply long standing but not necessarily true? I also think there are some complicated questions inherent in this about a constellation of factors that as humans we would describe as privacy and to a lesser extent security and trust. It's fairly clear in most of these cases with the animals there was not a lot of consent based activity happening here. No one asked the bees because how would you and what would that look like and if we're in a university would there have been a form? You know, informed consent for tracking would have been a fairly complicated negotiation with which to engage with most of these animals. But there are some interesting questions here about what does it mean to track without consent? What does it mean to think about how long that data is stored for? Where does it go? How is it kept? Under what circumstances? Where is it used? And by whom and for what? And all of those are questions that can reasonably be asked about all data. And some things perhaps have more notions about what consent might look like than others. But there is sort of something here about how do we think about that. You also start to see in this that some of the dominant threads that run through the last 20 years of compute, or certainly the last 10, are also now appearing in IoT, whether it's gamification, crowdsourcing, the notion of data sets waiting to be monetized are all kind of running through this. And so I guess, you know, where this kind of leads me to want to end, because I, as I said, let's, provo let's talk more provocation. I want to get to some questions. For me, there is a reason for kind of tackling animals this way, right? Which is to say, and I started by saying, if my job is to think about the future, one of the ways we have thought about the future is to look to animals, is to ask the question, is the internet of living things an augury? Does it tell us something about what our future might be with all these systems, right? I'm willing to bet most of us will not have the lived experience of someone Velcroing a camera to our heads or gluing an RFID tag somewhere on our bodies or attaching us to automatic milking machines. Those things seem pretty unlikely. But it is likely that we will live in environments that are increasingly tagged and sensed and that we will attach that sensing technology to our bodies. And so for me, I think some of the questions that are raised here by the animals about security and trust and risk and consent and sense making and normatization and algorithms are stories that aren't just about animals, they're going to be stories about our next 10 years too. So the question I think for me is if we pay attention to the animals, what will they tell us about our own futures? And so with that, I want to stop and say thank you.